ask the Lord to have his way in this place. We're going to give all of our focus, all of our attention to him. Amen. In Jesus' name. Lord, we love you today. God, we lift our voices right now. We begin, Lord, to turn our eyes toward heaven. We open our hearts to your purpose and to your plans for this day, God. We love you and we find that we need you so very much, Lord. If we have ever needed you, surely we need you now, God. And we are praying today that you would fill this place, God, with all that you are, with your perfection. Lord, I pray, Jesus, that you would come and complete a work in somebody today, God. You are the author, the finisher of our faith, and we know that today there will be many in this house, Lord, who are coming to know you. You've been calling them by your spirit. You've been leading them all week long, and we pray, God, that today you would begin a new work, Lord Jesus, for those of us that have been serving you a lifetime, God. We remember now your benefits, Lord. We remember the goodness of God. We remember your faithfulness, God. And we give you worship. We give you praise and glory and honor for all of the wonderful things that you have done. There's nobody like you, Jesus. You alone deserve our praise, our attention, our focus, our glory. Lord, we give it to you, Jesus. Come and consume the sacrifice of praise that we bring before you today, God. Come and consume our praise, Lord. Fill this house with you, Lord. Let the train of your robe fill this temple today, God. Let us perceive that you are in this place, Lord. Let our spirits identify that you are moving, that you are speaking, that you are working. God, that you want to intervene, that you want to interact with your people, that you have come to commune with us, Lord. God, every need that we might have on our hearts and our minds, let us trust in you to just take care of it, Lord. God, let faith arise in this house. Let the glory of the Lord arise in this place, Jesus. Let us be reminded of your goodness, oh God. Lord, that your word is everlasting. You are faithful. You are true. You are perfect, God. We worship you, Lord. We sing hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah, 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 Lord. We bring your praise into your house, Jesus. Hallelujah. God, we magnify you. Oh, no. 
Sometimes when you look at life, it seems so hopeless. You look around and you just say, it seems like everything is against me. It seems like everything is, is going in a negative direction. Can it get any worse? And you feel so low and so down. But you haven't looked everywhere yet. If you turn around, you will find that the goodness and the mercy of the Lord is following you. It's this way every single day. You may not see it, but he is there. He is reaching. It's called the grace of God. You may not be able to see it, but he is there. Trust him. Trust his promises. Those promises are yes, and they are amen. We want you to know this today. We even have an usher at the back door. His name is Hope, Brother Hope. We want you to know that all around you today is hope. There's going to be a word that will be preached. It will give you hope. There is an answer for your situation. There is an answer for your problem. And the answer is Jesus Christ the Lord. Let's praise him one more time. Jesus, we worship and praise you. You are God. You are our answer. You are the healer, the deliverer. And this altar is open right now for those who want to see that hope realized. We believe what the Bible says. The Bible says, if there are any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. And those elders are coming right now. And then let them anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. And that prayer of faith will save, which includes healing, deliverance, every answer that God can provide is in the prayer of faith in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost. So why don't you come right now? This altar is open for you to receive what God has for you. Amen. Let's all pray together in Jesus' name.
Somebody say, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, yeah. through it all, I've learned to depend upon His Word. Again, and through it all, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Yes, I've learned to trust in God. It is so sweet to trust you, Lord. moments in my life where I fail. There's moments in my life where others have failed me and let me down. Uh, there are organizations that fail, companies that fail, cultures that fail, governments that fail. But through all of those things, I'm so thankful that God has never yet failed me. He's never let me down. He's never left me alone. He's never forsaken me. But he's been with me through every circumstance, every failure, every difficulty. He's been faithful through it all. How many are thankful for that today? Amen. I'm thankful for that. It's so good to be with all of you. You can be seated. It's so amazing to be here worshiping with all of you. I think sometimes we take for granted the blessing that we have from gathering together, from worshiping together, from gleaning strength and encouragement from one another, all the little two-minute check-ins where you say hi to folks and check on them and see how their week went and how their family's doing. It's such an amazing blessing to be a part of the family of God. And we are so thankful for you. We're so thankful for all of you. Uh, it's so good to be worshiping with you today. It's so good to be with everyone here in person. It's so good to be with everyone joining us online today. And if you're new here, we're so grateful that you're here. We would love to connect with you. We know that it is difficult to walk into a church where you may not know a lot of people, uh, where uh, you're just wondering if there's going to be anyone there that's like you, that notices you. And we want you to know that we notice you. We love you. We're thankful you're here. Uh, regardless of what brought you here, regardless of the circumstance you walk in here today, we believe that God is weaving something in your life. He is working in your life. He's leading you and guiding you. And we're so grateful to be a part of your journey. We believe that God has peace and healing and restoration and direction and calling and purpose on your life. So thank you for being here. That's kind of a heavy greeting, right? Uh, all of those things. We're happy you're here. It's so great to meet you. And if you'll look in the pew just in front of you, you'll see this card. If you'll grab this card, take just a couple of seconds to fill it out. And then after service, immediately following service, as you make your exit through the double doors to the rear of the sanctuary, you'll see a our welcome center. If you would take this card to that welcome center, uh, drop it off there. We have a gift for you. I'll give you a little, uh, a little tip. It's a food gift. So if you're hungry, if you feel like service is going a little long, we'll give you a little snack after service. Just as our way of saying thank you, we would just love to meet you in person and connect with you. And if you prefer to do it digitally, you can scan the QR code there as well. And thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Every year, uh, in just a few weeks, we set aside some time during the month of May for May of Miracles. And we set this time aside because we want to grow in our faith and we want to grow in our trust that God can and will still move miraculously in our lives and our families and our church. And so we want you to start to pray over the, these next few weeks and start to contemplate what do you have need of? Is there a circumstance in your life that you've just kind of given up on? It just seemed too big, seemed too difficult to overcome. You say, I'm just going to ignore that. Have you ever had this? 
Have you ever gone to God in prayer and he brings something back to you, a vision or something that he spoke to you that he was going to do in your life and you forgot all about it? You go, God, I forgot that you even spoke that to me. I forgot that you gave me that promise. We want you to start to resurrect some of those prayers and some of those dreams that you would start praying for faith that God can still do the miraculous in your life. We focus on that throughout the month of May. We want to come trusting and believing that God's going to move in our lives, that he's going to perform miracles on our behalfs. And we just want you to come with big, audacious requests that if God doesn't show up and answer it, it's just not going to happen. Anybody have some requests like that? Anybody have some dreams, some calling, uh, some friends and family that have walked away and you go, God, I, I want to see them back serving you. But if you don't turn their heart, if you don't bring them back, it's never going to happen. We believe that God's not done writing his story in all of their lives regardless of where you find yourself, God can still work in your life. So we want to prepare. We want to expect and pray that we're going to see people added to the family. Still the greatest miracle that we see is when people are baptized in Jesus' name when they're filled with the Holy Ghost. We believe that we're going to see people baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost all throughout the month of May. We believe we're going to have uh, prodigals come home. We're going to see all kinds of amazing things. We're going to have some amazing speakers. We're going to have James Wilson and Nick Mahaney and Victor Alba and Doug Kleindenst. And we're going to kick off a little early on April 28th. We're going to start May of Miracles a week early. We're going to prepare ourselves with prayer and fasting. We're going to have evangelist Caleb Herring with us. And we want to let you know, we know that we made a schedule change for 2024. And we've been doing all family prayer on the third Sunday night of the month. That would be next Sunday night, the 21st. But for this month only, we're going to push that back a week. And we're going to do that on the 28th, the last Sunday night of the month. And we're going to merge that with our quarterly prayer and fasting. And we're going to have prayer and fasting next Sunday evening, next Monday evening, and next Tuesday evening, the 28th, the 29th, and the 30th. Not this week, but next week. Or not, ooh, let me get that straight. Not this week or next week, but two weeks from now. The 28th, the 29th, and 30th, we're going to have prayer and fasting as we prepare for everything God's going to do in the month of May. So grab an invite card, pray over it, give it to someone, invite someone. Your invite has the potential to change someone's life because God can lead you and work through you. So all you have to do is just say, God, give me the door, nudge me to invite someone. And I'm going to invite them and let you do the work. And we believe that God will indeed do the work. So thank you for that. This Wednesday night, we come back to our Wednesday midweek Life University sessions here in Cooper City at 7 p.m. We've just concluded our spring semester of small groups. How many of y'all enjoyed those? attended those, had a wonderful time. I know so many of you here were hosting those groups and attending those groups. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for connecting with another, one another. There's so much power in unity and relationship and connection. Thank you for doing that. Join us this Wednesday night. We're going to go a little deeper in our faith. We're going to study the word of God. We don't keep you long. Uh, it's only about an hour. And here, here's the thing. Can I just challenge you a little bit? I know it's tough to get back here on midweek. I know that there is traffic and school and work and meals and rushing around and all those kinds of things. But we would just love it if you would be here. It will impact your life. It'll grow your faith. And here's the challenge. Uh, think about your week. Are you ready for this? I'm going to get myself in trouble. Pastor Hadwell didn't put me up to this, okay? Uh, but we would love for you to give the same emphasis and importance to that midweek service that you give to taking an evening and relaxing or going to practice or doing whatever it is that you do. I know that we make time for those things. Make sure that you make time. There is power in coming together to study the word of God, to be with one another. So be with us this Wednesday night. We'll have kids sessions. We'll have young adult and youth sessions. We'll have our adult session in here. And then on the 24th, a week and a half from now, we're going to host RELCO, which is the annual meeting of the Caribbean and Central American missionaries and ministers. This is an amazing night. Uh, we host their meetings throughout the day. So many of you serve and bless those missionaries and ministers. But we get all of those missionaries and ministers with us on the 24th. It is a unique service. There's really not another church that gets to have all of those missionaries and ministers from Central America and the Caribbean with them on a midweek service. So come and be with us for that. We're looking forward to that. And we're going to announce one thing here. We don't normally talk about this uh, from this standpoint, but we have a newcomer's dinner that we do once a quarter for all of our newcomers. We had invited many of you to this Friday night.
but we need to postpone that dinner. We've had some scheduling conflicts, unfortunately. So we're very sorry for that. We will communicate a date change, but we just wanted to make sure that we didn't miss anybody. So if we, if you were handed a personal invite to our newcomers dinner this Friday evening, we're going to postpone that and we'll be in contact with you for a future date. Thank you to all of you who give so faithfully and so generously to impact lives, to change the world, to reach out from Cooper City legitimately all across the globe. Thank you for everything you do. Uh, can I give you one thing that your, your giving did last weekend? Uh, this is one of those things we don't talk about. We work with a group called Advance Camp and they come and they serve young men who uh, don't have a father in the picture. And they show up every other or every other month on a Saturday and they teach them a life skill so they can have some confidence and they just kind of those mentors put their arms around them and teach them and train them and love them and do a Bible study with them. And our church paid for all they did a, a grilling session. They taught them how to cook a little bit last Saturday and our church paid for all of the meat, all of the supplies for that. And you're giving does so many of those things thank you so much for that thank you for your generosity and let's pray today you can give at coopercitychurch.org you can give by texting POCC to 77977 let's pray for this service and for this offering Jesus we love you we praise you Father you're so good you're so worthy you're so kind you're so merciful to us above and beyond anything we could ever think ask or deserve God we're so thankful for your rich presence that we feel here today God we ask that you would receive this offering as we give it humbly God as we give it joyfully God we thank you for every blessing in our lives God continue to move and work and have your way in this service in Jesus name amen
blessing to have so many family guests friends here we're so delighted to have you here if you're here you're not a visitor you're a guest as I say often visitors just show up unannounced but we are prepared for you we've been waiting for you we've been praying for you before you even got here you're not just showing up we we know God was going to bring you and we know this is a special time that you get an encounter with God we're honored to have Pastor Zenobia and your family here Sister, Sister Zenobia is part of this church many many years ago with the Callaway family and Brother Zenobia came and rescued her I don't know if rescued or robbed it starts with R but we're so glad and now they pastor her up north and we're so glad that they're here visiting but the Josh Hernandez is here visiting for the wedding we had yesterday. Thank you, Brother Josh. We love you. And Brother Jason Benavides came to the wedding yesterday. So give all of our guests, all of our friends a great big hand. We welcome you today in Jesus' name. We're excited about one baptized on Friday afternoon and God's doing great things. Amen. Praise God. I will, I will say this. Please, please keep Israel in your prayers. Uh, your pastor's been very connected to Israel in many, many ways. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was in Israel at the Gaza border just a few weeks ago in the month of December, uh, working with the uh, military there and just bringing supplies. And so what you're seeing is biblical things that are coming to pass. The Bible says when these things start to happen, look up. I'm here to tell you, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Amen. The, the office of the Council General of Israel, I've been in high level meetings with them, two meetings this week. They actually call me during this situation. Uh, one of the, the men from Israel, one of the leaders from Israel reached out to me. He's with the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, this church is very, very connected. And if you have any questions about Israel and why we support Israel, please come see me or read your Bible. Either one is good. And you'll see why we stand with Israel. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for just a moment. I want to make a very special announcement. Sister Rocio Bibi and Brother Bibi, please stay up here real quick. Um, this is a blessed church. This is a church. We don't say a great church because that sounds worth pride. We're, we say a, a blessed church because we know that God's hand is upon it. Five people believe that. And, and we say that from Cooper City, we are changing the world. And, and obviously, in just in the last few days and hours, I've been sitting with very, very high-level people from our community, our city, leaders, uh, the, the, the great small country of Monaco in near uh, France and Italy, the, the great 
Council General of Monaco was sat right next to me on Friday in a very high level meeting. Just, just the things that God has allowed this church to do and exposed to is just, it's just really amazing when I think about it, how we are able to reach and change the world and affect the world. Youth on missions and we've sent missionaries from this church that from this church, from where you're sitting on these pews are serving around the world now. And uh, because of that, we understand that the, that the, the greatness of a church is not just measured in the seating capacity, but it's measured in the sending capacity. Every month we are reaching and touching uh, 70 countries around the world. Your giving, your support is touching that. And we've got pastors, pastors' wives, ministers' wives, ministers that have left, missionaries that have left here and that are ministering all over. And so because of that, uh, we, we, we have a very, very special announcement, specific announcement, and uh, this church is going to continue to send, and uh, we are thankful for Brother and Sister Bibi. I thank God for them for the last 15 years that they've been here and serving, and uh, he's going to come and make an announcement, then I'm going to say something, and then we're going to pray for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's ominous, isn't it? As Pastor said a moment ago, 15 years ago, I came and visited on a Sunday night. And uh, that night over dinner, Pastor Hadabal invited me to come be an intern. And it's been a long internship. <laughs> Amen. When I came, I was single, um, didn't have a lot of direction, didn't know what next stage of my life would um, present. And, uh, but Pastor, Pastor Hadabal, Pastor Volan, the staff, all of you, you open your arms to me and let me quickly become a part of the team and to be just so blessed by this wonderful church. Uh, shortly after, I met Sister Rocio and uh, we've been married for 13 years now. <laughs> Going strong. And we have three beautiful children and uh, they're all in Sunday school right now. And um, it's just been our pleasure to serve, serve this church, serve this youth, the youth group, your young people in youth camps, and NAYCs and youth on missions. And uh, I was just thinking about it a moment ago. I hope you don't mind me saying this. When I moved here, Carissa was 11 and now she's married to an awesome guy, Brother Orlando, who I taught a Bible study to. And uh, I thought, man, I'm getting old. Um, but uh, as I've mentioned many times, preaching and leading, my father pastors a wonderful church in South Carolina, and they have many times, never pressured us, but many times made the invitation that if we ever felt the call of God or the leading of the Lord to come and assist there and eventually become the senior pastor of that church in the next few years, that those doors were open to us. We've been seeking counsel both internally and externally, talking to our leaders and the multitude of counsel. There is wisdom. And um, late last year, beginning of this year, we began talking with Pastor about a transition timeline. And at the end of June, um, Sister Rocio and I and our three children will be transitioning to South Carolina to pastor there. <clears throat> We love you all very much. Um, it is not our desire to leave you, but it is our desire to be in the will of the Lord and to be obedient. Thankfully, uh, my wife's parents, my in-laws, they live just up the road here. And uh, Tio and Tia, Tio Jose and Tia Pati, they, they are here. And so we will be making the trip back relatively frequently. And I have begged when I'm here, if they'll let me be on the praise team and maybe let me preach a little bit. And so we will be seeing you. We love you very much. Praise the Lord, church. Um, 
I did this at the nine and I said I was going to be all right and um, I'm not. <laughs> um, uh, all I want to say is thank you. Um, we're singing that song earlier. The goodness of God. He has been so good to me. Even giving me such an amazing church family and letting me serve y'all and be a part of everything that's going on here. You guys have been part of some of the most amazing memories that I will have forever. My kids being born, baptized, Holy Ghost, so many things. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for um, being a constant support, being our biggest cheerleaders. And um, we will never forget you. It's one of the things Sophia keeps saying, they're going to forget us. And I said, no, baby. We will never forget them, and I know you guys won't forget us, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you for loving us, and we love you so, so much. I'm going to ask for the ministers to please join me on the platform. The ministries, please join me on the platform. We are thankful for them, and we've shared them over the years with so many different places and people, and we love them dearly. Um, when they came, as you heard, he was single, but he worked seven years and then he worked more. So it's very biblical. He actually worked more than Jacob did. So we're good. We're good. 15 years for his wife. And uh, we've watched him grow in stature and influence. They've become an amazing blessing to our youth, our church family, and our entire district. Brother BB was the district's uh, youth president representing us nationally. And I'm so thankful for that. And we've been a part of their journey as they've been a part of our journey. I know this is a little bittersweet. We're sad because we won't get to walk as closely and every day and every week in and out. We're going to miss them dearly, but they're still part of our family. And we're going to be POCC in South Carolina. Hallelujah. We're going to have a campus there, I guess, right? But we are very thankful for what God is doing in their life and the calling. And the true marks of a healthy church is not just reaching and retaining but it's also in sending. We're, we're given a wonderful opportunity to expand the kingdom of God by sending them to South Carolina to reach others. And they'll be fulfilling God's call to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we are also. And we're thankful for this. And uh, I know that they're still here with us through the month of June. This is not a goodbye today. He'll be ministering again. We're going to have time to honor them. But we wanted you to know ahead of time so you don't find out any other way. Does that make sense? We want... We're, we're very, we, we try to be very intentional here about communication. And if you have questions, please come see us. We always are open to door policy and we have open to communication. We wanted you to know quicker, sooner, rather than later than hearing it from anybody else. This last Tuesday, they announced it to all of our leaders. So we, it was next the step to announce it to you. But you'll have a chance to love on them, to say your goodbyes, celebrate. We'll have a big time of celebration for them also. But we're going to stand right now before he comes to preach. And we're going to pray for them. And we're going to ask God to be with them. And the ministers and wives are going to pray over them. The ministers and wives can come on up. And let's, let's surround them right now. And let's pray. Let's ask God to be with them. Would you join with me? Stretch your hands from the pews. And believe God that God's going to send them to be a blessing and see revival in South Carolina. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you, Lord. Thank you for Brother Bibi. Thank you for Sister Bibi. Thank you for their children. Thank you for the impact they've had here at POCC, in Coral Springs, in the state of Florida, across the United States, and literally around the world. And we ask God that the anointing and protection, direction, and blessing would go with them from right here in Cooper City. We ask in your name, Jesus, in your name God the things that need to work together come together for their for their move up there we thank you God you're going to open doors that no man can shut so we pray in Jesus name bless them God mightily in the name of Jesus and the church said in Jesus name and now I need you to preach with him like like you know how to preach with a great preacher that he is would you welcome brother Bibi as he come Come on, would you clap your hands unto the Lord? Amen. Come on, let's clap our hands unto the Lord. Isn't he good? Hasn't he been faithful? Amen, amen. 
Now, can we just have church? Hey Amen. It'll just make me feel a lot better if for the next few minutes we can forget about that announcement and we can just have church, all right? Hey Amen. I do want to say, I don't know if I adequately did, and I cannot adequately enough say thank you, Pastor Adabal. I owe you a debt, a debt of gratitude. I can never repay you, and I love you. Hey Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 23. All right. Now, I gave somebody some preaching advice once. I don't know. They asked me. I didn't, you know, it wasn't my idea. It was theirs. And I said, the only real advice I got is preach it like it's good, even if you don't think it's good. Today, I'm going to preach it like it's good. I hope that you'll help me. Amen. Amen. I'm going to preach it like the Holy Ghost is moving, like you're moving, like you're clapping, like you're lifting your voice, like people are responding. And if I got to preach it by myself like that, I'm going to. But I think there's some folks in the house that want to testify of his goodness, that want to celebrate his great name. Luke chapter 23, and then we will turn to Luke chapter 24. Chapter divisions are not original to the scriptures. As you read the end of Luke 23, you will see that it seamlessly transitions to Luke 24, that this is one story that is being completed. And so we're going to carry the end of Luke 23 into the beginning of Luke 24, Luke 23, 55 and 56. And the woman also, which came with him from Galilee, the women also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandments. So these women, they follow those who carry Jesus' body to be laid to rest in the tomb. They go home. They they prepare spices and ointments. They rest according to the Sabbath. And then verse 1 says, Now upon the first day of the week, very, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. I'm going to say that again. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words, pay close attention to verse 11. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher. And stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Today, I want to preach to you from that passage and from this title. See for yourself. See for yourself. Amen. Would you clap your hands unto the Lord? Come on, let's give him some praise for just a moment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. It has been called the greatest story ever told. And sometimes we think of the cross as the climax of that story. But if the cross were the climax of that story, it would be a tragedy. The climax of that story is not the cross. The most significant and highest moment in human history, the climax of God's story as a man in the man Christ Jesus is found at the tomb. Just three days prior, it seemed all was lost 
the one they had all put their hopes in, their hopes of a new kingdom, of new freedoms, of a new king were seemingly lost forever. The disciples had scattered. One had denied and one had taken his own life in grief because of his betrayal. Fear has gripped Jesus' followers. Would the Sanhedrin arrest them? Would the Romans execute them? Or would, their, would the memory of their once promising movement just simply fade into the past? Would the men who had followed Jesus just go back to their ordinary lives as fishermen and tax collectors and other ordinary citizens? Think about that for a second. Of course, they were frightened that their lives may be in danger. But they must have also been frightened to think. Just a few weeks ago, we were walking on water. We were feeding 5,000. Jesus was speaking to tombs and people were getting out of the grave. Can we really just go back to being ordinary fishermen? Can our lives just go back to the day-to-day? -day? Can we go back to the insignificant lives we were living without Jesus? This is the atmosphere surrounding the events of the text we just read this morning. The disciples are hiding away in an upper room. The only noteworthy movement by Jesus' followers was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and other women that were going to the tomb to anoint the slain body of Jesus. They were not going to the sepulcher out of a deep sense of faith. They were not going to the garden to see a risen Christ. They were going, fully expecting to find the stone in front of the tomb. They expected to find the lifeless body of their Lord in the grave. They did not expect to find what they found they found the stone had been rolled away. Amen. I know Easter was a few weeks ago, but we still celebrate that the stone rolled away. And when they entered in, Jesus was not there. Instead, they found two men standing there in shining garments. Why seek ye the living among the dead, they asked. He is not here, but he is risen. This is this is the moment. This is the greatest event in all of human history. He had been dead, but now he is alive. He had been buried, but now he is risen. This is the reason that Christians exist. This is the reason that churches exist. This is the reason we sing about him. This is why we worship. This is why we clap. This is why we give. This is why we're faithful. This is why we Sunday morning. This is why we Wednesday um, uh, service. This is why we youth event. This is why we send missionaries. Because once he was dead, but now he is alive. Because of all the miracles Jesus did, the one that testified of his divinity the most is, he said, I'm going to die, but I'm not going to stay dead. And die he did, but death could not hold him, and the grave could not hold him. His word was true. He was not a liar. He was not speaking in fables. The women who went to the grave that day were shocked. But they should not have been shocked. Jesus had said many times that he would die. And that after three days he would rise. But for some reason his followers could not understand. Jesus often spoke in parables. And when Jesus would speak to the crowd in his parables and as the crowd would go away... The disciples would gather around and they'd say, uh, Jesus, could you explain what you're talking about? We don't even know what you were just talking about. The sower and the seed and the, and the ground and a coin and a lost shepherd and, and a lost sheep. And what, what does that mean? And I just imagine that when Jesus started talking about his death, 
when Jesus started talking about the grave and the sign of Jonah and destroy this temple, they thought this was just another one of his parables that they didn't quite understand. How could Jesus die? Jesus speaks to the wind and the waves and they obey. How could he die? Jesus goes to the funeral for the, the widow's son and all of a sudden it's not a funeral anymore but it's a new birth. And Jesus steps into the tomb where to the graveyard where Lazarus is laying dead and with just a few short words, Lazarus come forth. Lazarus comes out of the grave. How could a man like that die? They could not believe he would die. And when he did, they could not believe he would rise. We don't know a lot, but we know that death is final. While they're still on the table, there might still be hope. While they're hooked up to the ventilator, there might be a chance. While, we're, while the church is still praying, we can cross our fingers. But once they're in the grave, the story is finished. Uh, the, the, the answers have all been supplied. Uh, we know how this story has ended. And so these faithful saints that had followed Jesus go to the tomb fully expecting to find Jesus in the grave. The women who went to the grave, they were shocked, but they should not have been shocked. Jesus had said many times he would die and after three days he would rise again, but for some reason they just could not understand. In our text this morning, the angels were standing and waiting, two men standing by them in shining garments, reminded them saying, remember, remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee. There is no uh, parable nature to this statement. He said, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. He'll be crucified and on the third day he will rise again. Jesus spoke often of his death and resurrection. At least six times in the Gospels, he declared he would die and rise again. The disciples could not believe he would die. And when he did, they couldn't believe he'd rise again. There have been times where I was amazed at their lack of understanding. Guys, he told you. He said, I'm going to die. They're going to bury me. And I'm going to come back. At least six times in the gospel, he made this declaration. He told them multiple times, but for some reason, they could not believe. And sometimes I think, how did you miss it? How did that go over your head? How did you not figure that out? When they was crucifying him, why didn't you go, hey, he said that was going to happen. Everything's going to be all right. But then, if I'm honest, if I'm truly honest with myself, there are times when I don't understand his promises. There are times I have a hard time believing his word. He not only told them he was coming back, but he declared unto us, there's coming a day when he's coming back for us too. Sometimes when, when, when the, there's dark clouds overhead, when things aren't going right, when, when I'm facing trials and tribulations, I know you face heartache and pain. I know there are bad diagnoses and death and there's political unrest and wars and rumors and wars. And I know that the economy is volatile and the housing market is disastrous and gas prices are out of control. I know that your mind and heart are constantly bombarded by television, radio, social media and in the midst of all of this sometimes our faith can struggle and we're going to say how are we ever going to get out of all this but remember he didn't just tell them he was coming back but he said to me and you there's coming a day I'm coming back for my church there's coming a day when the eastern sky is going to split and a trumpet's going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise first to meet him in the air and those of us that are alive and remain shall be caught up are you looking forward to that day I know sometimes we forget I know sometimes we forget that one day we're going to be walking on streets of gold one day we're going to walk through the pearly gates one day we're going to see Jesus Hey man, this is the part. I'm going to preach it like it's good. That day's coming. Every day we get just a little bit closer. Let, 
Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go away to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you may be also. We used to sing about it a lot. We used to sing about heaven a lot. We used to sing about that day when we're going to be called up. We'd sing songs like, oh, what singing? Oh, what shouting on that happy morning? Anybody looking forward to that happy morning when we all shall rise? Oh, what glory. Hallelujah. When we meet our blessed Savior in the sky. You still believe that? You still believe everybody will be happy. You looking forward to that day? Say, we'll be happy over there. We will shout and we'll sing God's praise. Everybody will be happy over there. You got any loved ones that have already gone to the other side? You got any that are already on those streets of gold? Mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers will be singing round the throne in that land where no one ever knows a care. And the Christians of all ages, that's you and me, will join in that triumph song. Everybody will be happy over there. Come on, we ought to be excited about heaven. We ought to be excited about heaven. There's coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore. There we'll meet the one who saved us and who kept us by his grace and who brought us to that land so bright and fair. And we will praise his name forever as we look upon his face. Everybody, everybody will be happy over there. Do you believe it today? He's coming back. He's coming back. In the face of war, he's coming back. In the face of economic downturn, he's coming back. In the face of famine and disease, he's coming back. Don't forget. Don't forget. I'm coming back. What he promises will come to pass. He came to pass in our text this morning. He said after three days he would return. And he did. And the women were standing in the garden. And the angels reminded them. And they joyously ran back to the disciples. Peter. James. John. Andrew. The rest of you guys. Nobody remembers their names. We went to the tomb. We had, our, we had our spices. We went to the tomb. We were going to anoint him. And when we got there, the stone was rolled away. And he wasn't there. He wasn't there. His, his linen clothes were there, but he wasn't there. And we didn't know what to think. Another gospel says they began, to, they began to weep. What have they done? What have they done with our master's body? And they began to weep. Oh my goodness, what happened? Did the Romans take him? Did the Jews take him? And then suddenly there were two men in shining apparel standing amongst them. And they said, why? Why search you? And they're telling the disciples this. They reminded us. They reminded us and said, said, why search for you? For the living amongst the dead. He is not here. He is alive. Do y'all remember that? Do y'all remember in Galilee? He told us he would rise again. It's true. He rose again. And in verse 11, it says, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. They was like, Mary. 
sweet thing. Women can just be hysterical sometimes. Let me mansplain something to you. When somebody gets crucified and dies, they don't come back. No, 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 no. But listen, listen. He said he would. I, I know, I know. But you must have misunderstood. You see, because we saw him. You remember the spear in his side? You don't come back from that. It says that the disciples, they, they, it's all of them. It's them. And you know what? Just go with me on this. Peter's the big mouth of the group. It's probably him. Joanna, you can't be serious. We, remember, we followed them to the tomb. We saw where they buried him. He's not alive. Th these are just tales. This doesn't, this is not logical. This is so, it's not pragmatic. What you're saying about Jesus just can't be true. It's too good to be true. But the more the women protested and the more the men just dismissed them, Peter kind of gets quiet. He starts kind of drifting to the back of the argument. And eventually he stands up and he makes his way over to the door. And he says, I've got to see for myself. I know it don't make sense. I know it's not logical. I know that I saw him dead. I know I saw him in the grave and I can't just take your word for it. I've got to go look for myself. And he runs through Jerusalem and he runs to the garden tomb and he looks inside and he verifies for himself. He is not there. He is alive. Now, here's the question I have for you. If they do not believe, what's Peter doing running to the tomb? If they do not believe, why didn't he just sit there with his arms folded and his legs crossed and just say like Thomas, I will not believe. But there's something in Peter. It's the same something that says, Lord, if it be you, bid me come and steps out of the boat. There's something in Peter that says, I've got to see it for myself. I've got to try it for myself. I've got to go to the tomb for myself. Their testimony sounds too good to be true, but I'm going to go see for myself. Let me tell you something, seeker. Jesus does not ask you to simply have blind faith. Every time somebody tells you Christians just go off blind faith, they've never been to an apostolic church. He is inviting you here today to come and see, to come try me, to come test me. Let me bless you. Let me love you. Let me save you. Is there anybody here that can testify with the preacher for just a minute? I went to the tomb. I went and saw. I went to an altar and he was there. He is not dead. He was waiting for me. Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord. He's alive. He's alive. You can see it for yourself. How do you know? How do we know he's alive? David said it better than I can say it. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgiveth all thy iniquities? Who healeth all thy diseases? Who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy? I don't have blind faith. I've tried him and I've found him to be true. He's healed my body. He's touched my mind. He saved me just in time. Some of y'all been saved too long. You're acting like you don't remember when you ran to him and you peeked in the tomb to see if he was there. You weren't sure what you were gonna find, but he was waiting for you. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. He is waiting for you. Today, I want to make the same appeal to you. Come and see. Come and see. You don't, these were the words of Jesus. Jesus said, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me. Come unto me. I feel like Philip is Philip today. Philip stood before Nathaniel and declared, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. When he saw the doubt in Nathaniel's eyes and heard the skepticism in Nathaniel's voice, Philip did not try to convince him with enticing words of man's wisdom. He only declared, well, come and see. Can it be true? Did the one that the prophets spoke of, did the one that Moses talk about, is he really here? Is he really from Galilee? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Just, just come and see for yourself. When you lay eyes on him, when you hear his voice, when you feel his touch, it's not going to be my testimony that convinces you. It's gonna, you're going to be convinced when you see for yourself. You're going to be convinced when you get in his presence and know he is the one. The Samaritan woman, the woman at the well, the woman of Sychar, a woman whose life had been torn apart more times than she would like to remember has one brief encounter with Jesus. She has one moment with Jesus and she runs back into a town that she avoided and that avoided her. And she runs back into a town saying, come see a man, come see a man that told me everything that I'd ever done. There are some things that I cannot explain to you. There are some things that I cannot convince you of. I I can't explain joy unspeakable. I can't explain peace that passes understanding. I can't explain peace in the night. I can't explain victory in hard times. I can't explain rivers in the desert and streams in the wilderness, but you can come and see for yourself. Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord. Come on, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let somebody who's experienced it testify to somebody who hasn't. If you will try him, you will find him. If you will seek, you will find. If you will knock, it'll be open to you. Come and see. Come and see for yourself. Oh, taste and see that the Lord he is good. I told a story once about a college professor who felt that it was his responsibility to at the end of the semester that every believer would denounce their faith. Many times at the end of class, the semester, he'd say, now, if you still believe in all this nonsense, all this hocus pocus, why don't you stand and frightened 19 and 20 year olds not wanting to be embarrassed not wanting to feel illogical or uneducated would be too frightened but at the end of one semester there was an elder gentleman taking a class sitting in the back and he said does anybody still believe and that elder gentleman stood up and he said how can you believe that he is real the man reached down and grabbed a paper sack, rolled it open, reached in and grabbed an apple, took a bite of it. He said, Mr. Professor, sir, was this apple sweet or sour? And he said, how would I know? I've never tasted it. And the man said, I still believe because I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. <laughs> It's not because I was convinced by someone else's argument. It's not because I was convinced by somebody else's worship or somebody else's song. But when I was nine years old, I came down to an altar and lifted my hands and God filled me with the Holy Ghost. And he's real, he's real. I've tasted and seen the sweetness of life. He is alive forevermore.
in Peter's day, he literally went to the tomb and he found Jesus was not there. He literally went and saw for himself the testimony of the believers was true. Today, I'm not inviting you to make a journey to Israel and look into the garden tomb, but you could. At the end of 2022, we took a trip to Israel. When we were there, we saw all the wonderful sights. We went to that garden tomb. Our guide that day was a Christian a seminary student. Most of the time when you're in Israel, your, your guides are Israeli. They're Old Testament believers, not New Testament believers. Now they know the history. They know the sites. And they know the geography. But they don't believe what the New Testament says is true. But our guide that day, he believed. Scripture says that the garden tomb was nearby the place of the crucifixion. And so they take you and they sit you in this location where you can look down the road here. And they say, you see that old Roman road? That old road, dusty road, you see that old Roman road? That's where the history and the geography teachers and the Bible scholars believe Jesus was crucified. See that road right there? You see the, the hillside? You see the hill right there? The shape of the skull in the rocks? This is where it got its name, the, the place of the skull. This is where we believe Jesus was crucified. And the nearby garden tomb, here's the garden tomb. It's a expensive, wealthy, it's for wealthy people. Jesus was a poor man buried amongst uh, rich men. And, and you see all the beautiful tombs, you see. But there's one tomb that the stone is rolled away. And they took us and we looked inside. There's a sign above it that says, he is not here for he has risen. We looked inside. Then we went and took our seats and the guide said, listen, I've shared with you all the geographical knowledge, all the historical information, but this is not why we believe Jesus is alive. We believe Jesus is alive because of you. The evidence that he is alive is because of you. Because you should be dead. Because you should be strung out on drugs. Because you should be in prison. Because your mind should be broken. Because your heart should be in two. But Jesus is not there anymore. He's alive. Come and see. Come and see. Oh, taste and see. It's real. It's real. I know it's real. The musicians would come. I am inviting you today to become the evidence that he's alive. I'm inviting you in just a moment to make your way down to this altar where you can lift your hands. Feel the rush of the Holy Ghost. Come and fill your life. I'm inviting you to make the journey to the waters of baptism and feel the grace and mercy wash over you. I've seen, I've seen thousands, I've been blessed with through youth on missions and evangelism and this wonderful church. I've seen thousands of people filled with the Holy Ghost. I've seen thousands of people baptized in Jesus' name. You know what I've never heard one person say? I've never heard one person say, well, that was good, but I wish I'd have waited a little bit longer. I wish I'd have drank one more bottle of whiskey. I wish I'd have had one more affair. I wish I'd have blew a whole, one more whole paycheck on the lottery. I wish I'd have smoked another pack. I wish I'd have got high one more time. I never heard one person make that claim. I never heard one person say, well, it was good, but not as good as I thought it would be. But I've heard hundreds of people say, this, this is what I've always been looking for. The only decision that I would have done different is made my decision just a little bit sooner. This is that. This is what I was looking for. Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord. Clap your hands unto the Lord. Why don't you stand to your feet? Amen. Amen. I wrote two closings to this sermon because I didn't know how it was going to go. I never preached this before. Today, 
I'm going to give you both of them. (laughs) Preacher's prerogative. I've told this story before. My parents pastored a church in New Orleans when I was just a child. They didn't have a lot of success. I'm going to make it quick. They didn't have a lot of success in that church. The only real success story they had, they were young. They were only in their early 20s. Difficult situation. It was a young couple that my dad started teaching a Bible study to. Johnny and Lisa Morgan. Lisa came to church, got the Holy Ghost, started serving God, but Johnny never really showed a whole lot of interest in it. About a year passed. On Sunday morning, dad's getting up to preach and Johnny comes and sits on the back row. You hear dad tell the story, he said, I preached a terrible message. Nobody liked it. Nobody came to the altar. Wife and kids were probably mad at me. It was just always bad. He said, I was kind of embarrassed, knelt down to pray. Somebody tapped me on the shoulder. Pastor, Johnny's in the altar. Dad got up, walked over. Hey, Johnny, how can I help you? He said, Pastor, when we met you, we were strung out on drugs. We were facing divorce. We yelled and screamed and threw pots and pans and broke dishes and our kids were afraid of us and our home was full of strife and bitterness and hatred and anger but my wife came to church and God filled her with the Holy Ghost and she don't yell and scream and cuss no more and she don't throw pots and pans anymore and she's not strung out on drugs anymore and she's being blessed on the job and she's being blessed in the home and whatever she's got I want it too I don't need another Bible study. I don't need a history lesson. You don't have to tell me who did what way back then. Whatever she's got, I want it too. I want to try it for myself. I want to see for myself. I want to taste and see for myself. Johnny lifted his hands. My dad laid hands on him. God filled him with the Holy Ghost. That's been 30 plus years ago. Johnny and Lisa are still married, still serving God. Their children in the church. Their grandchildren are in the church because it's real it's real it's real you don't have to take my word for it you can taste and see for yourself second corinthians 5 10 says this for we must all appear before the judgment seat of christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad 2 Corinthians 5 the apostle Paul is speaking to believers and admonishing them to live their lives to be pleasing unto the Lord to walk with the Lord he is reminding them that one day these earthly bodies will wear out and they will die that one day we will all stand before Christ to be judged and that each of us will receive what we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this life all of us are going to stand before the Lord Another passage says that one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. Every believer and every non-believer. Every faithful and every non-faithful. Everyone of all ages from from centuries ago and, and for decades into the future if the Lord tarries, one day we are all going to bow before the Lord to be judged. When we are, Jesus will say either well done well done good and faithful servant enter into the joy of the Lord or he will say depart from me you worker of iniquity I never knew you today you have an option you can wait and see or you can come and see I'm asking you today, don't wait and see. Come and see. You will not regret it. You will not regret the blessing of the Lord. 
you will not regret the blessing in your home and in your family you will not regret all of his benefits you will not regret it would you come and see lift your hands all over this place come on lift your hands and lift your voice come on turn your voice towards heaven Lord Jesus if you're speaking to me Lord Jesus if you're calling out to me Lord Jesus I struggle I've got faith I've got issues with my faith I've got issues with doubt I've got issues with skepticism but Lord if you're drawing and inviting draw and invite me draw and invite me let me see I want to see if you're real let me see Church, I'm inviting you to this altar right now. I'm opening this altar for whosoever will. It's for whosoever will. Would you come and drink of the waters of everlasting life? Listen, I need you, church. I need you, POCC church family. If this is your church, I want you to come down to this altar and make this altar an, inv an inviting place for those who are seeking. Let them know if you will seek, if you will search, the Lord, the Lord will be waiting for you. Would you come? Would you come when you get in this altar? Just lift your hands. Just lift your hand. Lord, I'm here. Lord, I'm here. Lord, I'm here. I want to see. I want to see for myself. Come to stand. Come on, would you come? Come on, saints. Come on, leaders and elders. Come put your arm around somebody and encourage them. Tell them it's real. It's real. He is a healer. Do you need healing? He is a healer. He's a deliverer. Do you need deliverance? He can deliver you today. Do you need the Holy Ghost? He will pour out his Holy Spirit on you. Come and see. Come receive.
Hey 